for taking time on a Friday evening to attend our gala. I confess that this is our first gala event, that is why I call it special. It has um, uh, lots of things in it, and you, uh, I'm sure you will, you will enjoy it. So before uh, proceeding, I would like to say a couple of things, nevertheless, about our um, event today. In your invitation, and you already have had that, we mentioned that actually this gala is dedicated to our sixth anniversary. So uh, we are not very old, we are actually pretty young. <laughs> okay. And it is dedicated also to um, our summer school participants. And you have seen that there are summer school participants helping us with this gala. Some of them are here. And we want to fundraise for our summer school participants from the developing world who cannot actually afford to pay the registration fees and study uh, in Manhattan. So thank you so much for contributing to that. And also, we are very honored to uh, celebrate Dr. De Bruyne. Dr. Charles De Bruyne is our co-founder. So, going back a little bit in time, 
because we are a little bit late. We co-founded Global Biotics Initiative in 2011. It was incorporated in um, uh, New York State, and we got the 501c3 two years after. And Dr. Charles the Brofner uh, helped me particularly um, uh, with his um, friendship, emotional, and financial support to put together this um, organization. Now, as I mentioned, one of the Global Biotechs Initiative's more successful programs has been uh, our summer schools we have organized and we initiated since 2015. Now this year, it is our fifth edition in Manhattan. We also organized one in Dubrovnik in 2016 with the um, University of Zagreb School of Medicine. And we are going to launch a new one in Bangkok in August, and I would like you to join us. There is still time to apply, yes, uh, in collaboration with Oxford University and Welcome Trust. So that's a very interesting uh, new endeavor. It would be um, very interesting if some of you or some of your friends of friends, okay, please, yeah, can you, just a second, please, because we don't have chairs. So we have to, yeah, please, yeah, yeah, you're welcome, yes, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I was saying that we're going to go in August to Bangkok and uh, where the, the East meets the West. And uh, we, um, I also wanted to say that our summer school has had participants from almost all continents Asia, Australia, Europe, Africa, North and South America. We would like to express our gratitude to the not notable lecturers, some of them in attendance here, who dedicated their time and scholarship to contribute to our summer school's success. I would like to uh, give my particular thanks to my students. They worked very hard. We worked very hard together to, push, uh, to uh, put um, uh, this event, to organize this event. And um, also, I would like to give my special thanks to my friends, fabulous friends. Some of them are in the kitchen, so <laughs> they're taking care of the, of, the, of the food and to uh, arrange everything for us for the cocktail reception. I will um, go back to Dr. Charles de Brofner. Uh, much of what the Global Biotechs Initiative has accomplished could not have happened, of course, without the guidance, leadership, uh, vision, and amazing support of our honorary president and co-founder, Dr. Charles de Brofner. It is in his honor, in fact, uh, that uh, this event has been organized. We are immensely uh, thankful for all of his work, advice, support. We want to give our special thanks to his family for the encouragement they have provided over the years to the organization and to myself personally. On behalf of myself, our current president, Dr. Harry Silverman, is there, our new president, and our board and advisory board members, we want Dr. Dubrovnik to express our deep gratitude to this event, to you. Special thanks to Dr. Fred Ricciardi, at NYU uh, professor of gynecology and embryologist, and also a fertility expert, you see, uh, three in one, who uh, very kindly agreed to lecture for us this evening, but but also to sing. So I met Fred to, to Dr. De Brofner, I think a couple of years ago. We invited him to have a presentation uh, on the occasion of one of our events on reproductive rights um, under the commission of the status of women at the UN. 
And, um, and then Fred agreed to also lecture at our summer schools. Now, after his presentation, we'll have a short Q&A because we are a little bit late. And Fred will sing for us. He is a composer. He is a singer. He has a beautiful voice. And I think this is the first gala I have ever heard about with a fertility expert who is also a singer. <laughs> and it's also the first gala with a fashion show I have heard about. And it will be a wonderful surprise to see about 10 young models um, being part of the program tonight. And I would like to say thank you to Alexandra popescu York, the designer and the artist, and also to her uh, brand coordinator, who is uh, Gabriela Pandu. Now, these two girls are Romanian. And not all the mothers are Romanian. <laughs> so, I don't have their bios, but it's a diversity of models coming from uh, various countries. And thank you so much to all participants, your bright participants, for joining us today. So I hope I didn't, um, I didn't take too much time with this introductory remarks. All right, so Fred, you have the floor. So we're going to talk about fertility, but um, I, I want to make it clear that I don't want to make this too complicated, at least in the beginning, because people who suffer from infertility, the numbers are quite high. So I was just by counting the people in the room. Is that? Did you have that? Yes. Just by counting the people in the room, I have to make an accurate assumption that many of you are associated with people who suffer from infertility. So it's, I think it's always nice to know a little bit about it. So here we go. Um, people get pregnant pretty quickly, but then it levels off. So 
So if you're not pregnant after six or 12 months, then the odds of you getting pregnant that 13th month are 3%, which is low. Can you advance, if I ask you to advance, that works? Sure. Okay, no, no, uh, no surprise, it's harder to get pregnant as you age. This is data that goes back 50, 60, 80 years ago in, in populations who just wanted to try in a row and back then. So ovulation, where does ovulation really take place? A lot of people focus on the ovaries, but it really takes place in the brain. Uh, there's the cortex, there's the midbrain, and then there's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is everything. Right? The pituitary gland controls our thyroid, our adrenal glands, our pancreas, and it controls the ovaries and the testicles. What is the pituitary gland makes hormone go back to the follicle stimulates hormone. Follicles, i.e. the eggs inside the ovaries are in follicles. So that's where it all comes from. Uh, next. And ovulation progresses. The ovaries do two things. They make eggs and hormones. This all sounds obvious, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, next, please. So it's a little hard to see, but the estrogen, we're all familiar with estrogen and progesterone. A lot of people think, oh, those are so important for the embryo and the baby and everything else. They're immaterial. The only thing estrogen and progesterone are important for is to make the lining of the uterus thicker. So, there's, so um, um, just to say, the picture on the right is the, now, just trust me on this one, okay? <laughs> the uterus, when estrogen goes to the uterus, it makes it a very fluffy place. And if you don't have estrogen, you can't get pregnant. Or progesterone next. Right, we can skip. We'll skip some. Skip. We'll skip. So people come to me. What, what can we do to help them get pregnant? Well, you want to make sure they're, they're, get, they're trying. Believe it or not, that's a tough question that we sometimes get a surprising <laughs> answer to. <laughs> so we have to ask. Sorry, we got to ask. Um, and timing is very important. So a lot of people just are unaware of when the proper timing is um, in the middle of the cycle, two weeks before the period comes. So we do a very basic workout. The workup is not complicated. I think the complicated workup keeps people away from seeing a fertility doctor. But it's kind of easy. We do a blood test, we do an x-ray, and we check the sperm next. Okay, back to, this is what happens to egg number as a woman ages. Uh, women are born with their eggs. You're born with two million eggs to the women in the room. Then, when you hit puberty, you have 500,000. So you've lost uh, three quarters of your eggs doing, walking around in diapers, you're losing eggs. It's really true, it's horrible, but it's true. And then from the time uh, pu uh, puberty to menopause, maybe it's 40 years, women lose a half a million eggs. Well, that doesn't make sense because if you do the math on ovulation, it should be 500 eggs. So the fact is that eggs are dying all the time. And that's why we really want our women to get pregnant as early as they can. This is just another way of looking at it. They count over time. It's, it's ugly, but it's, it's true. So we measure, there's a hormone that we can measure in the bloodstream, we determine how many eggs a woman has. Now it's not like they have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, but if you put them in a group, low, medium, or more high. So that's part of the work. In fact, you might see there's, there's a lot of publicity now about egg freezing, and women fighting out what the fertility are. You see trucks literally on the streets of New York and in other cities. What are they doing? They're measuring women's AMH. They're saying to women, hey, so if your AMH is two or three or four, the higher the better. If it's less than one, that's actually not very good. Okay, next. Next. Okay, so we have to check anatomy. We've got to check the plumbing. We've got to make sure that the tubes are open. Next slide. So here's a beautiful picture. You know, some people hate these pictures of surgery. And some people love them. I love them because I don't want to do that. But so if you're interested, um, that's a huge, I'm sorry I'm a pointer, but that kind of circular thing in the upper left is the uterus and there's a and, and this looks great. So keep going. <laughs> This is a close-up of a beautiful tube and an ovary. Next. Uh, we, so we'll push dye through the tubes to make sure they're open. Next. And this is an x-ray. And that triangular, upside-down triangle in the middle is the uterus. And then the tubes are to the left and to the right with dye flowing through. So this woman is fine. Next. So if these, this is scar tissue inside the pelvis. Next. You go back. So this one is normal. And then go back with one. 
and this is not normal. So I think most people can see that a woman, it's, this is not normal. There's scar tissue, there's adhesions, there's cysts on the ovaries. These are things that we look for. Uh, next, we also look at the x-ray for the uterus. If you look, there's almost, there's two bananas here. This is a uterus that actually has two compartments. Some women are just born with this. We look for this and we help them. Uh, fibroids, we've heard of fibroids. These are benign tumors. 30% of women have them. We look for them. We want to make sure they're not in the right place. Think about fibroids. 30% of women have them. But most of the time, they're, they're not wrong. They're not in the wrong place. They're not too big. And we're, we're, and we're very happy just to tell our patients, look, you're okay. But sometimes even a small one is in the wrong place. Next. So the first picture on the, on, to the left has a fibroid growing right in the middle of the uterus. That is going to keep people from getting pregnant. The other ones are not a problem. Next. Next. That's a problem. It's pushing the uterus away. Next. Ah, sperms. Part of the equation. Part of the equation. So what about that? Well, we count it. Next. We put it on a slide. We just counted the boxes and how many are there. Next. Pregnancy rate is related to sperm count, but only when it's low. So at the very, the nice straight blue line at the top is the pregnancy rate based on sperm count. So if a gentleman has a sperm count of about 50 or 250, it really doesn't matter. But it's when it's under 20 million, that's when we really get into problem with very low pregnancy rates. Next. So it could be a genetic problem, it could be infectious. There are doctors who take care of that. We send them to the urologist, they look for hormonal issues, etc. All right, so that's just kind of a background, the tubes, the sperm, the NH level, age as a factor. So now we'll go into what we're we going to do to treat next. So we do insemination, interuterine insemination. Why do we do insemination? Because during intercourse, only 1% of the sperm make it from the vagina to the uterus, and 1% of that make it to the tube. So I did like this graphic here. You see 10,000 dots, then you see, you know, 100 dots, and then you see one. That's what 1% 1 of 1% is. Very few sperm are getting there. But the fact of the matter is, most people get pregnant pretty easily. Um, but we do things to tweak the system. So we'll take the sperm and we'll just shoot, we'll bypass, we'll get a sample, we'll put it into the uterus itself so that the cervical mucus doesn't block the sperm, that when we're, we're not dealing with that 99% that loss. It helps a little, next. Doesn't help a lot, adds a few percentage points. All right, next. There are drugs that we use. There's two types of drugs. There's pills. In the shots. Most people would rather take a pill than a shot, but the pill doesn't work as well. The shot works better. Um, the pills are great for people who don't ovulate. You may have heard of a drug called Clomid or such. Great for people who don't ovulate. They start ovulating regularly. When I say they're not ovulating, they typically know this because they're not getting their period every month. They might get it every two months or three months. For them, the pills are perfect. But in women who are getting regular periods or ovulating already, Pills don't do so much. Really, the shots are better. So we use a lot of them. So there's a couple stories about the shots. Keep going. Yeah, we'll skip those. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Uh, so clomid is a pill. You take it. What does it do? It increases that hormone. That is that I mentioned. It comes from the turret. Now, clomid has a little story. I have a few stories. When clomid was invented, probably in the lab, who knows, in the 40s and 50s, maybe the 60s, um, they found this drug that kind of blocked estrogen, it blocks estrogen. And the pharmaceutical geniuses were like, this is amazing, this is going to be an awesome contraceptive. And they gave it to women, and guess what happened? They got pregnant at a higher rate than if they didn't take it. So <laughs> that's how we figured out that clomid works pretty well to help people get pregnant. Next slide. We'll specific. Now I'm going to say, so these are the injections, and the injections have a cool story too. So FSH is a hormone that we all produce, men and women, but it's produced at very high levels for women who are in menopause because they don't, their body doesn't realize that their ovaries have stopped working. So the FSH drives and drives and drives the ovaries to try to do something. So if we're going to give this FSH to women who are infertile because it's going to stimulate their ovaries, the best place to go is to menopausal women because they have high levels. And where are their levels high? Their levels are high in their blood. But their levels are also high in their urine. So there's this whole story about this drug company, Serona, who was the first company to make FSH. And where did they get their urine? Because they were in Italy. They got their urine from nuns. I know, it's crazy. And the, the Catholic Church, of which I'm kind of a member of, we can talk about that later, but um, 
they decided that fertility was a bad thing, right? Treating fertility, all those, that was not so good. But they also decided that there was a lot of money in that SH. So they actually were the largest stockholder in this company that made this SH. And there's, there's books written about it. There's, it's a spy novel, there's murders. I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. But the, you see the swimming pool in the middle, that's what they do. They take the shirt and the, duck, the, wooden, the cart on the horse, the horse cart, will go around to all the nunneries and collect the urine in the morning. It's almost like reverse milk. And then they would take this urine and dump it into a swimming pool and then use some very basic, I know it's crazy, basic methods to distill to take out this FSH hormone. And believe it or not, even though I'm telling the story in the past tense, there are some companies that legitimately still, still work along this way. A lot of it is done in the lab now. We're not using urine. We're using uh, cells that are grown in the lab. But next slide. All right, so let's talk, you know, we're here with the Bioethics Initiative. We should talk a little bit about the ethical and the psychological effects of infertility. So infertility causes extreme distress. It raises anxiety. It raises depression levels. And believe me, I see this all every single day. Lower esteem, feelings of blame and guilt, somatic complaints, right? That means pain, I have stomach pain, I have headaches, all related to fertility and reduce sexual interest, all related to infertility. Um, there are social situation difficulties, right? You're, you're a young couple, you're a young woman, you're at a birthday party, and people are like, hey, when are you having kids? Me and my, like, all your, you know, brothers and sisters having kids, maybe your nieces and nephews are having children. Um, that's a problem, next. Um, there are, the consequences also affect a woman's relationship to her community, her economic situation, her in-laws, legal and marriage, and spiritual issues. Now, these aren't so relevant in the United States, but around the world, it's a really big deal. Next. A woman who's infertile can suffer significant economic hardship, social isolation, even violence, right? And the denial of proper death rights, which again, in the US doesn't sound crazy, but around the world, these are major issues. This was a study looking at Vietnamese women in the 80s. And what they found was that in their society, it is important for women to demonstrate their fertility with one, one year of marriage. Okay? The son's wife takes care of her in-laws. That's how the society works. No son means a lonely life for the elders. We're familiar with that. Carrying on the family name. But if there's, a, if there's a lack of pension or no financial support with, without children, and women without children are powerless, among other things. So let's skip down and kind of discuss the consequences of infertility will be HIV. So there are certain societies where if you're not pregnant via your husband, you, they will, the elders or the society will have you try to get pregnant with another family. If that doesn't work, then they may have you try to get pregnant with a stranger. And so this, is, this was a big call to the World Health Organization a number of years ago, because why would the World Health Organization care about infertility? Well, if they care about it from this medical angle, it's very important. All right, we don't in vitro fertilization. That's what we do quite a bit of, next thank you. So women take hormones for two weeks, they get monitored, blood tests, and ultrasounds, then we take the eggs out of their body, we inseminate them, i.e. mix them with sperm, we get some embryos. Next. So, see, um, that's the uterus, you're familiar with that. The ovaries are those kind of cookies, chocolate chip cookies on the left and the right. Yeah. Ovaries don't normally look like that unless they're stimulated with a sage, thanks to the nuts and everything else. So we get multiple eggs, we put a, we put a needle into those fluid filters just to get a, we get an egg. This is what it looks like on ultrasound. This is an ovary, each one of those dark areas is a fluid filter with an egg in it. And if you have good eyes, you can see kind of a straight needle coming down a little bit to what I think is called next. So I don't know if we're gonna be able to see this video. Um, let's try, this is good. No, I don't see a, uh, it is. We'll try it. Let's this Maybe? Okay, so. Uh, let's 
see it here, I see it here, I see it. You don't know what you're missing. I see it, I see it, I see it. Okay, so this is an A. Thank you very much. That's a needle. At the very tip of the needle, there's a little dot. That's a sperm cell. It goes through the shell of the egg. A kind of halo around the egg. Believe it or not, is a shell. We all hatch. That's true. We all hatch. Now, the embryologist now is just trying to get this needle into a good place. And then that sperm is kind of rolling back and forth. There it goes in and in. Boom. Into the egg. And this is one method that we use to fertilize eggs. Now, we don't always have to do that. The sperm count is good. But many, many men have very low sperm counts. And they're just, I mean, it's a cliche. All it takes is one. But it really takes millions. So that's how we do it when the sperm counts are very low. Thank you. It's going to be another video. Not right away, though. So be on your toes. Okay, so after the egg fertilizes the upper, the upper left, that's a two cell embryo, then you have a four cell, then you have a eight cell. So the embryos are dividing inside our laboratory next. Then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's called blastocysts. So if you look at the upper, you see a, kind of a halo, those are cells of the placenta. And that kind of bump at, at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, those are the cells of the fetus. Those are the baby cells. So there's a distinction. Even on day five in our laboratory, we can tell which cells are which. The zygote always results in twins. This is an natural issue because in order to improve my pregnancy rates, I can put in more embryos and make myself look good on paper, but is that a good thing for the patient? It's a horrible thing for the patient. Yes. So I mean, here's the graph. The blue graph is when singletons deliver. When do singles deliver? And that's when they do. And the green is when twins deliver. So you can see that there's a huge shift. Twins deliver prematurely. It's an it's a increase. It's a problem for their health. It's a problem for cost. So currently, we, we put we just put in one embryo. We put in one embryo in most of our in most of our cases. Next, um, this is just a graph showing that we used to put in we rarely put in one, and now we almost always put in one. Egg freezing. So maybe we're doing that time. Maybe I'll just finish with egg freezing. Egg freezing. Um, egg freezing was a very. Oh, I have one more. I'll show you that. Why do we freeze eggs? Because women are running out of eggs. Slide. Some women need chemotherapy. What does chemotherapy do? It, it reduces your egg number. Sometimes it can make a woman go completely into menopause. Um, some women need, have cancers that aren't, don't necessarily treated by chemotherapy, but they're going to need their ovaries removed to save themselves from the cancer. A lot of women do what we call elective egg freeze. They're healthy. They just want to preserve their fertility for down the road. Um, next. Next. Again, showing egg number decreasing with age. Next. 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 Just another little story about eggs. So egg freezing is another little story that goes back to Italy. So there was a time when in vitro for, in Italy when you were not allowed to fertilize more than three eggs. Because the Vatican has effect on what's going on in the region, in the, in the, in the, basic, in the rest of the country. And so they didn't want all these extra embryos in them. They felt that it was immoral and unethical, etc. So women, when they do in vitro, many of them make 10 eggs or 20 eggs or 30 eggs or 40 eggs. So if you could only fertilize three, what are you going to do with the other eggs? They were throwing them out. So egg freezing was a very difficult thing to do in the laboratory, but it took root in Italy because they were the ones had, who were worried, who now had all this extra material to study and to play with and to maybe work harder to try to get eggs to freeze. And they did it. They did an excellent job. Next. Ice is the problem. Egg freezing, you've got to get out the ice, because ice makes knives. Next. The cells literally shatter. They cut up when you expose a cell to ice. You've got to get out the ice using crowd attractants. OK, last little topic. Um, Pre-implantation genetic screening. So now we test embryos for abnormality. This is for a long time, it was a very hot topic, ethically. Is it okay to, to find an embryo that has Down syndrome and not and discard it or not include it? Or, uh, yeah, that, those, are the, those are the main things, but there are other issues too. What about gender selection? Is it ethical to have five embryos find the boys and maybe you want a girl? A lot of people in Europe want girls, 
Um, maybe you want the girl. Is it ethical to leave embryo boy embryos in the freezer indefinitely or destroy them, etc.? Next slide. So keep going. Well, um, going just one more. No more. No more. No more. Okay, we're gonna watch this video and how we take some cells off the nuclear. Now, most of the time we're doing, we're all familiar with Down syndrome, right? Because those are the children that live. Right? The, when an embryo is five days old, any of the chromosomes can be missing or extra. So this is how we do it. Don't find that red star in the middle. That's just the... So this is an embryo that's hatched. You see the halo and part of it is coming out. Again, we all hatched out of an embryo. And within there, it's hard to see, but there's hundreds, a hundred cells in there. Oh, you can, you can see. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a laser. We're going to get a little closer here. This is warming up. My voice is very nice to the face. So here we go. This is all done under the microscope. Those are cells. They're kind of elongated. They're oblongs. So you can kind of get a sense for that. And then that cross mark is a laser. And the embryologist is literally just cutting with a laser. You can't see it. Um, and there, there you go. We just take off a few cells. We take those cells, we send them to the laboratory, and they tell us, is that embryo? Trisomy 3, you mean that? Chromosome 3. Monosomy 4. These are the most common reasons why people do not get pregnant, either with in vitro or on their own. And it's the most common cause for miscarriage. And a woman who's 40, if she gets pregnant, she has a 40% chance of having a miscarriage. You know, counting from when she first does her pregnancy test early on. If we do this procedure, you eliminate the chromosomally abnormal embryos, her miscarriage rate goes to 10%. So that's a really, really powerful tool that we have. So I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna leave it at that, and I'm very happy to have any discussion. I can ask me anything. So it's still better to freeze an embryo. So there's many steps that need to go along, but they're very similar. Egg freezing is very similar to embryo freezing. The difference is, the difference is an egg is harder to freeze than an embryo. Why is that? Primarily because an egg is a much larger cell than embryo cells. So imagine this is an egg, one cell. Imagine this is a hundred cell embryo. It's in the same space. It just, every cell gets smaller and smaller and smaller as they divide. It's easier to get that cryoprotective into a smaller cell than it is a massive cell. The other thing also is, is that the egg is kind of in transition. It's just been ovulated, it's waiting to get fertilized. There's certain more delicate things that are happening in an egg and are happening. And then an embryo, once it's fertilized, it's growing along, just not all the it's just churning along. So a little bit easier to freeze. But we've had great success with it. I mean, if it weren't good, we wouldn't offer it. But if a, if a woman comes in and, I, and, I, and she, she may not be aware, she'll say, I'm here to freeze my eggs. And I'll say, well, do you have a partner? And I'll say, yes. And I'll say, is this your lifelong partner? And she'll say, yes. I said, well, then I strongly suggest freezing eggs. Embryos, right? Sometimes it's a bit tricky. I've never met the guy before. And you come in, maybe she breaks the boyfriend. I'm like, listen, I know we never met, but are you the guy or what? If you're not the guy, then you got to freeze your eggs. And if you are, then you got a future embryo. Because 10 years from now, if he's not the guy, you're going to want to throw his bad embryos away. You know what I mean? <laughs> Even though they're your eggs. should become parents for whatever reason and you know the fact that there's so many kids selling their sperm three times a week so that there are thousands of children coming around but my main concern is the ethical questions for some of these IVF programs or, or just you know donor programs sure sure not at NYU of course no no <laughs> listen man we're all part of it you know we're all part of it and 
problem is, and it's very hard to figure this out, there's, there's no way to really regulate or understand the quality of a clinic. You know, we see these pop-up clinics all over the place. And one of their ounces, some of them, will say, okay, we're gonna freeze your eggs, but when it comes time that you're gonna use your eggs, we don't, we don't do that. We're gonna send your, you'll send your eggs wherever you want, and they'll do the thawing, they'll do the fertilizing, they'll do the embryology. Well, that takes all the burden off of them because they don't have to see their, see their work completed. A place like NYU or other very established places that we, we, we take our patients from the beginning to the end. So I think a lot of the ethical issues is also about marketing, right? Should you, should you have a cocktail party and give people two glasses of wine and talk to them how great Egg freezing is when they when you really didn't explain it that well and they don't have a great understanding of that. I see that all I see women in my office and when we I see a woman who's gonna freeze her eggs, I spend 45 to 60 minutes with her. I have a lot to say. And part of what I say is, well, let's talk about the complications, let's talk about the side effects, and let's talk about well, are these eggs gonna give you a baby? What are the odds of these eggs really? Because there's tons of attrition that takes place. Not every egg survives to thaw. Not every egg that survives fertilizes. Not every fertilized egg grows into an embryo, and then a massive percentage are just abnormal. And they look at me and they say, oh, you know, I was at the place up the street and they didn't tell me any of this. They just said I was gonna come here and it was all gonna be good. So I, I, I understand, you know, I understand what you're saying. I, you know, the internet and social media is a double-edged sword. I think it's been really good for people getting information. Hey, I want to go to Cornell or Columbia or NYU. What are they like? And, and you'll get good information about those programs. The problem is you're also getting you know, news about you know, feeds from other programs that may, may not be as, as established. It's very hard for me to criticize what they're doing because they could. I mean, these, these people in that practice They've gone to medical school, they've done a residency, they've made you know, an oath to take care of people. And some of them may be awesome. I just, I just have no way of knowing. Yes. Um, do babies that come from frozen eggs or frozen embryos have any more medical issues as adults? So um, the question is, do children born from eggs or embryos that have been frozen, are they, are they sicker? And the answer is that if you look at the birth defect rate in humans across the board, it's about 3%. It depends what you call birth defect, but it's about 3%. If you look at in vitro, irrespective of whether it's frozen or not, it's a little higher. It's 4 or 5, some, some studies show 6%. And we're not sure why that is. The feeling is, is that we're taking a population who's in flow, and maybe there's a genetic reason why they're not getting pregnant. Now we're pushing the envelope hard we're doing everything we do to get those patients pregnant, and that may have something to do with it. We, we don't think it's the lab, we don't think it's the medicines, because if you look at studies of women who get pregnant, uh, women who have been trying to get pregnant for two years, no fertility treatment whatsoever, and then after two years they get pregnant, their, their um, birth defect rate is higher. So it may have something to do with all that. So, thank you. I'm, I can't tell you how much fun this has been, and I'm going to talk a little bit more, but uh, not, not just yet. But thank you very much. So I couldn't get it all into the talk of uh, Chuck as we know him. Chuck, everyone's okay with Chuck? So here we go. Um, yes. So Dr. DeGrabo's family came by way of Russia and then Great Britain, for those of you who don't know, and he grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Chuck was a member of a religious family. Uh, he attended the synagogue in Brooklyn, of which there were many. 
And his family was trying to decide which synagogue to go to, and they decided that since the one was a half a block closer, that was the one. That was it. And it turns out that was the more, uh, I don't know, orthodox or conservative synagogue, and that was the one that Chuck attended. Um, truly, his early experiences were very meaningful. Um, and they led him to enter college as a comparative religion studies major. Next. Uh, Dr. Robert attended James Madison High School. By chance, it was his neighborhood school. Um, there he was in the social athletic club playing softball. And it's a very, very advanced high school. Eight out of nine players on his team went on to advanced degrees. Chuck, I'm sure you were the captain. I'm sure you were directing everything. Right? Um, that school, if you don't know, graduated seven Nobel laureates. Seven. Um, Chuck and Pat um, have their names inscribed in the James Madison High School Wall of Distinction. Now, they met, I hear, at age, about age 15. Now, Pat lived right around the corner from Chuck. Um, and Pat was very busy then because she was chosen as the lead in the National Company for the Innocent. So she was roaming all around. And somehow, Chuck ended up taking her to a party by mistake because her escort was sick that day. And so, who better to stand in? Charles McRobin. <laughs> now, Dr. McRobin was brilliant in high school. He was accepted to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Who does that? That would be a new source. Um, but he thought that Harvard kids were too nerdy. So he decided to go to Yale. <laughs> At Yale, he marveled in learning about each of the world's religions. He learned so much about them that he came to the following conclusion. Next, he told me that since all the religions are similar and they all can't be right, they must all be wrong. So Chuck left religion. Uh, and he went on to study zoological sciences and learned so much that he was permitted to skip the first year at NYU Med School, making him the youngest in his class. Skip the last skip year. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Still making him the youngest in his class. Um, uh, Chuck also became a frontrunner once he became a practice of a surgical procedure called a colgoscopy, which is the first minimally invasive, we're all familiar with minimally invasive laparoscopies, gallbladders, etc. But Chuck pioneered some of the work there, and that set him up to be a skilled laparoscopic surgeon, repairing fallopian tubes and treating endometriosis. Dr. Crawford was a true humanist before the word was invented. He studied and appreciated, and this was his quote, this was just Actually, I found it very beautiful. The toll that infertility took on a patient's marriage and well-being. He, he, just to have a recognition of this is just amazing. He was the first fertility doctor to hire a full-time psychi psychiatric social worker. Every patient was required to see the counselor. And that just said so much about Chuck's interest in the mental component of infertility. Yes. In the 80s, he went on to be the founder, one of the founders of Repro Labs, the largest commercial sperm bank in the Chrysler area, still going today. Um, as you heard, that uh, he and Pat were interested in ethical issues from the very beginning. They were members of the Ethical Cultural Society and the um, Society for Secular Humanism. A few things here. Annalisa, I know you don't like to see your picture up there, but we have no, to say thank you. I don't like that picture, thank but you. that's okay. I don't know where you're following. For those who don't know, that's it. Same place you got mine. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Annalisa, for those of you who don't know, Annalisa oh, earned a PhD in Applied Ethics and Social Philosophy. Uh, she speaks, I don't know, six, at least six languages. So no, no, four. Four plus, <laughs> I'm sure. And she's done amazing work with the organization. Okay, Dr. Robert was drafted during the Vietnam War, but government deemed him indispensable as a physician. So he had to work in Bellevue during that time. But he was under reserves, and he um, trained in the art of military hospital units, national units. Chuck, remember summer camp? Trails end. Trails end. From age 13 to 18, becoming a counselor and a swim instructor. It's still there. Um, Dr. DeBrogger 
after practicing, spent it, or during practicing, spent a good deal of time defending physicians who he felt were wrongly accused of medical malpractice. And he then went on to his current role of reviewing cases of physicians who have had complaints brought to them uh, by the New York, by New York State, long to see the um, you heard about Pat, many of you know about Pat. Long career as a professional actor, uh, starting when she was only 13. This is from her bio, but it's, it, for those of you who don't know, she appeared in leading roles on North Broadway in both plays and musicals, and in many television and radio dramas. She and Dr. Broadway married in 1959. He was in his last year of medical school at NYU, and she was in the original production of Jitsu with Ethel Murray. A year later, she stepped into the role of Ellen Stewart in the daytime television series As the World Turns, where she was there for 35 years. Wonderful career. Thanks. Um, you know, Chuck would talk about his family. I wrote a lot, of, a lot of things down about his family. He spoke so highly of his family, so proud of his family. Um, it was really fantastic. Uh, proud parents of Diane and Carolyn, grandparents of Abigail and Jane. Um, and Pat took on a hobby, or an interest, or a passion, I suppose, of performing weddings, 130 of them, at least, probably more now, um, and uh, had the joy of uh, officiating at Diane's wedding. So, all right, so this is, this is the end, but I it's a few slides, but it, it's an amazing story. Chuck, Dr. Grodner has many claims to fame, and there's one story that was particularly remarkable. Next. So when in college, Chuck and a friend started a Korean book drive, sending books over to post-war Korea. Next. Now, Eleanor Roosevelt, yes, the Eleanor Roosevelt, got wind of this and summons them to her private home. Next. So the young men uh, spent the day with her, and during their time there, they marveled at the beauty of her swimming pool. She insisted that they take a swim, but Chuck had to reveal that he did not bring swimming attire. <laughs> she would have none of this, none of this. So she collected a suit from her collection, and yes, Chuck spent the day swimming in Eleanor Roosevelt's FDR. Oh, FDR, I'm sorry. <laughs> So I'm gonna, I'm gonna and, and then just some photos of Chuck and his work here next, and his beautiful wife back, and uh, the, the wonderful <laughs> family that he's born into the world. All right, that was an honor. Over the next three years, we're going to be examining the ethical, legal, and social aspects 
of reproductive and sexual rights and of population aging. The experts we have assembled for this evening's panel have very broad backgrounds and extensive experience. I have no doubt that you'll find your presentations to be both illuminating and thought-provoking. We look forward to a lively exchange of views on this most pressing issue, which of yet remains to have been adequately addressed. We hope that these deliberations will pave the way for concrete actions to combat this crime, such as what specific areas for further research should be prioritized, and what mechanisms and policies should be introduced. I'm now pleased you should have let me. <laughs> so, the moderator of our discussion, Dr. Natalia, co-founder and executive director of GBI. Dr. Lee has a PhD in social philosophy and applied ethics from Bowling Green University. He's carefully studied and followed the developments of organ transplantation and trafficking. And I'm sure you'll find that she's well-versed on the issues and passionate about the need for their solution. So please welcome Dr. It's a very interesting clip. And also, the launch coincided with the Valentine's Day. Everybody was there. It was packed. All right, so thank you so much for this video clip. And now, uh, Fred, do you need water before we proceed? <laughs> Okay, so I'm being summoned to the piano, which is really fun. But it's you you don't have to listen. <laughs> just you can talk, it's very social, it's very calm, and it just we're gonna let some music fill the room and I want you all to relax and, and just enjoy the atmosphere. Thank you.
song that I wrote. Like, yeah, that's it. Like a lot of Chuck and I think alike, and 
you know, this, it's, it's a lot, it's a big burden for a woman to, to suffer from infertility. So you'll hear things about her doctor and you hear, her, you know, her friends and all the things that you spoke about in the lecture. So um, it's called Baby Two. I just want to have a baby two. <laughs>
while I think have a daughter of Margaret Nakagawa, who's also an immunologist. And they talk about the fact that an apple doesn't fall very far from the tree, but an egg doesn't fall very far, far from an ovary. <laughs> Forgive me if I have uh, printed up some remarks, but uh, my memory isn't as good as it used to be. But with Google and car navigation, I get around still pretty well. <laughs> I really very much appreciate uh, GBI honoring me tonight. However, I think that there are two ladies who deserve to be honored far more than I do. This is the sixth anniversary of the founding of GBI and my partnership with Analita. And it's one week before my life partner, Pat, and I celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. <laughs> there would be no GBI today if it were not for Anna. She's the ultimate people person, whose ability to develop close relationships with people all over the world and gain their cooperation with the many projects that spring from her fertile imagination never ceases to amaze me, and it makes doing what I can to support these projects so satisfying. GBI has progressed from contributing to the ethical education of the United Nations personnel, to student internships, and summer education programs that you heard, not only in Dubrovnik, uh, Croatia, but this summer in Bangkok. She's developed close connections with academic institutions ranging from Hunter College to Oxford University. The development of GBI is never far from her mind, and her working full time to make the highly unlikely happen, but makes the, anything that we could just bestow on her uh, totally uh, obviously necessary. My love for Pat actually became more than, began more than 66 years ago, and you heard a little bit about how that happened. Actually, uh, I didn't take Pat to the party, she was at the party, and I took a uh, a young woman who was going to have a surprise sweet 15 party. My deal was if I got into the party, uh, I could leave the party and go to my, my, my softball team's party, the Warriors. As it turned out, Pat was there and we uh, never separated. We left for the party together and the rest is history. Uh, Pat and I actually uh, probably are as well suited to each other as any couple I know. Uh, it would be hard to find two people uh, who are so well matched. We complement each other, and she's the artist, and I am the scientist. She remembers names and past events, and I remember where she left her keys. <laughs> she can tell you the telephone number of everyone we know, and I can make our frozen computer and printer start working. <laughs> we have shared and contributed to each other's very different careers and have supported each other in many ways. We both retired not from something, but to work. <coughs> My new work as medical coordinator in the Office of Professional Medical Conduct of the State Health Department combines my knowledge of medicine and the importance of ethics. Pat has founded, and for the past 14 years, has been the producer, script editor, actress, and sometimes director of the Ethics in Theater monthly play readings at the New York Society for Ethical Culture. And I'm her sound engineer. <laughs> she is a humanist celebrant, and when she performs a wedding ceremony, I give Pat a gift of the video that I have made of the ceremony. At home, our partnership has extended so that I am now assembling the salad each night. That's Pat's favorite part of the dinner. As might be appropriate for his infertility specialist, it took us four pregnancies to have our two wonderful children. Our wonderful daughters, Diane and Caroline, and their loved ones, Daniel and MJ, could not make us more proud and happy. I'm glad that the whole family, uh, including uh, our granddaughters, as uh, Fred told you, uh, Abby and Jane are here, and uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, uh, Dr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Stuart Danoff, and uh, Nancy and Neil Kaplan are here to celebrate the event with us. I would like to thank the Board of GBI for choosing them to honor me, but especially for the work that they're doing to support global bioethics education. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here tonight. Supporting GBI is much more important than honoring me, and I hope that you continue to do so. As I look around this beautiful building, I think, well, maybe if you 
Support is hard enough, people will get a building next door. Hard to, hard to follow. Uh, I would like to appreciate my, uh, give my appreciation to the volunteers who supplied the entertainment and services that we're enjoying, and especially to my friend and colleague, Dr. Fred Ricciardi, uh, who has helped move reproductive technology far beyond what I was able to provide when I was trying to vote my career uh, to helping infertile couples, but also for sharing his many other talents with us today. Uh, I'm honored, but I'm also humble because I can't write songs or anything down. Now I understand there's more to come. So, Anna, you want to introduce the next events? And thank thank you. you so much. It's not accurate. So I apologize for that. My students uh, picked up that bio of Pat uh, from we don't know where online. And Pat is not a piano player, she told me. <laughs> so, so, besides, uh, Abigail was not mentioned there. So I apologize again. And we have a little surprise also for Pat. And this is as she loves uh, jokes, right? And I would like to read what is on that. So this is Global Biotics Initiative's uh, motto. Can you say that? What's the pronunciation? Is that correct? Respect the unexpected, but always hope for the best. Oh. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Both of you, oh, I, I, I thought you would love it. I do. You love it. <laughs> and we would like to have a photo with with that beautiful. And 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 I think here, 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 of course. And then, I think I did not mention MJ and Daniel. So oh, you did. You did. Yes, you did. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, I feel so. Okay. Yeah. So without this, we have to take a photo. If you want, you can take a photo with us because we're uh, helping, uh, helping me actually not to be constantly on stage uh, myself. <laughs> summer school last year. Now George is over there and she, uh, he is, it's not a she, it's a he, from China. He keeps on feeling us, as you see. George uh, kindly helped us as a volunteer last year and we have a couple of video clips and I hope that this time it works. Can we? Okay. I just wanted to say what a great learning opportunity and experience it's been for me to learn from some of the greatest professionals of this country and giving me a new perspective of bioethical issues in a country outside my own. I can imagine not attending. This is the future for the science that we're discussing and the issues that we're discussing um, are so pertinent already and they will be as the technologies uh, that we're discussing become more readily available. I became interested in bioethics through my study of philosophy and psychology because I became gradually interested in practical ethics, which led me down the pathway of medicine that looked pretty fascinating. And I was right, it is. We've got great lecturers. I really enjoyed our talks, but for me, the best part has been the debate. I find it as a very interesting training program with diverse lecturers, diverse topics, and students or entities from different countries. So I think that it would be a very great opportunity to know more about research ethics and bioethics. 
So it's a good chance to meet the new people, to listen to the new lecture, to know also the new technology that uh, deal with the issues in bioethics and what are the solutions of the uh, ethical data. I will be lecturing on data ethics and the ethics of conducting research in the pediatric population. I'm really pleased to see so many people from around the world sharing ethics research and stories and challenges in the world of bioethics. I'm doing the summer school program because I'm very interested in learning about these bioethical issues and this is the first time you know, taking the summer school course helped me to realize a lot of the issues that go around internationally, um, even across our country and globally. We are Thomas Carter from Ethics and Transportation, Ethics and Research, Ethics and Pediatric Research, and how to do patients and even subjects. It is a very interesting journey. I like the diverse uh, topic set. It, is, uh, it has a fabulous uh, program uh, full of a lot of uh, nice uh, uh, topics uh, and lectures, as well as the films uh, for the last week. It's highly organized. I particularly enjoyed the talk on the ethics behind repro genetics and organ transplantation. I think in our day and age, with the advancement of technology, it's imperative that we, as medical professionals, are educated with how to approach these issues and how to make sure that everyone is living in the most ethical way possible. It's been a very rich experience. When I go back to the kind I'm going to adjust my research because I've learned a lot and I'm moving ahead to establish what I call African Bioethics and Education so that I can really start to the bioethic needs of our communities. I took this course because I believe that it's important for us to know how to approach ethical problems in our daily lives and also as professionals. And because I'm hoping to go to law school, I'm hoping to learn how to approach each one of those questions with an ethical and moral standpoint. I'm definitely really excited about the summer school because being a biology major, um, I think the field of bioethics is very relevant to me. Uh, everything from issues in global health, uh, human rights, public policy is definitely something I'm very much looking forward to and I'm very excited to see how the program will turn out. This is the fourth year that I've attended the Summer Institute on Bioethics. This is probably a unique institute that I've ever seen because it draws fascinating people from all over the globe to share their ideas and their cultures and their perspectives on bioethics. As a future surgeon, I believe that ethical considerations concerning the very sensitive situations I will encounter on a day-to-day -day basis are very important and that I should expand my education on them and that is why I decided to do the Global Bioethics Summer School. We have high powered care doctors, surgeons, lawyers, and uh, bioethicists and each one has a unique perspective on the subject of bioethics and I think this is what makes this program unique and has given me the education that I first saw when entering this program. But um, not only did the scholarship help me, it helped 
a lot of the students who saw in the video, and um, one of them we saw, her name is Nada, she's from Egypt, she lives there, and we became such close friends during this program that I keep in touch with her every day, I mean every week, um, and it's so wonderful to have uh, such a different cultural perspective on these ethical issues, and to uh, share these with her, and I'm very grateful to have been part of this program. So. I want to thank everyone in this room for supporting um, a program that calls on young professionals to think critically about the medicine and the biotechnology that we have available to us these days because school certainly doesn't do that for us. So thank you so much for supporting this program.
want to learn something. We will go on the stairs and we will take pictures with the models so that we can uh, not only celebrate this evening and the amazing Alexandra Popescu and her coordinator there, because they work, because they work uh, together. And we will take some photos with the models so that we will tell people that this is our first first ever fundraising with a fashion show and we hope Alexandra will collaborate with us in the near future and we can go ahead and have this kind of amazing models showing us beauty, youth, enthusiasm and amazing dresses. Thank you so much. So ladies and gentlemen, please join us for the party. So the party just 